As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the name of the living God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Maundy Thursday resonates with multiple historical connections, which our liturgies encourage us not just to remember, but to reenact performatively. On this, the night of the betrayal and arrest of our Lord, it's customary to keep a vigil until midnight, recalling Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, about which we reflected last Sunday. Yet it was also on the same night that he was betrayed that Jesus celebrated his last supper with his disciples and instituted the Holy Eucharist. In ordinary years, without coronavirus restrictions, this is a festal service. The liturgical colour is gold. Churches are filled with light and music. Significantly, for the first time at a sun Eucharist since the start of Lent, we sing the Gloria. Despite the importance of Maundy Thursday as the institution of the Eucharist, the Gospel reading this evening describes a different part of the story of the Last Supper. Jesus washing his disciples' feet and his declaration of a new commandment, that we should love one another, the Novum Mandatum that gives today, Maundy Thursday, its name. John also included at this point of his narrative an account of Judas' departure from the table out into the night to betray his Lord. In ordinary years, as clergy kneel to wash the feet of members of their congregations, we're drawn into this drama. Here we confront a reversal of conventional social order, an ethical message to care for and stand beside one another, as well as a sacramental symbolism. Everything that Jesus said in this passage about the washing of feet could also be said of the symbolic washing of baptism, the moment when the believer comes to share with Jesus. It too is a once for all act never repeated, since baptism brings with it forgiveness of sins, other sorts of purification become unnecessary. With all this depth of symbolic meaning in the Gospel reading, the Last Supper is left to our epistle, St Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which reminds us, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I've chosen to reflect today on an image of that meal from the Christchurch Picture Gallery. This anonymous painting comes from Venice and dates from the second half of the 16th century. Unlike other images of the Last Supper from Venice in the same period, which tended to dwell on the shock and surprise occasioned by Judas' betrayal, this is an intimate, almost tender representation. Here, Christ sits slightly off-centre in a domestic setting and feeds one of his disciples. With his white hair and beard, this figure has the characteristics normally identified with Peter. He leans towards Jesus, his face illuminated by the flickering candle flame, so that we see the intensity of his concentration as Christ places the morsel in his mouth with his own hand. The younger man on Christ's right, watching carefully, is probably the disciple whom Jesus loved. He and the disciple standing with his back to us closely observe Christ's actions. But the disciples around the rest of the table and the groups to both right and left appear to have ignored this little interchange. We see them absorbed instead in their separate conversations. The description of this painting as a night piece is telling. In the portion of John's Gospel that is usually omitted, John recounted how Jesus identified the one who would betray him as the one to whom he would give the morsel of bread. He explained how once Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, had taken the bread, he immediately went out and, John wrote, it was night. But in the image that we're contemplating, it's not Judas receiving the morsel. This is Simon Peter, Cephas, the one on whom Christ had promised to build his church. 
As we focus on Christ feeding Peter, so this image reminds us of the last recorded encounter between the two men at the end of John's Gospel. There, the risen Christ asks Peter three times if he loves him, before he says, feed my sheep. Peter smarts at the threefold question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But he does so, of course, because the question is a reasonable one, in the light of Peter's threefold betrayal of Christ in the courtyard on that awful night, just after his arrest. Even in the manifest love and intimacy that lie at the heart of this image, the theme of betrayal sits just below the surface. At every Eucharist, every time we keep the feast, we re-enact the events of the Last Supper, when Christ fed all of his disciples, including the one who would betray him, with the bread and wine that symbolised his body and his blood. At each service, the President says the words of institution that Christ taught his disciples on the night before he died, the words that Paul used in his letter to the Corinthians. This is my body. This is my blood. He and we, with the Spirit's aid, in saying those words, thereby create the body of Christ, not only in the bread and the wine on the table, but in ourselves. We, the body of Christ, who celebrate this act of thanksgiving, do so together. Even at this time of distancing and church closures, when some of us have not received the Eucharist for many months, the body of Christ still celebrates the act of thanksgiving together. As the priest blesses bread and wine on behalf of us all, many of us have begun to understand more deeply what it means to be members of the one body and to consume the bread and wine which are, to us, Christ's own body. Even when we're not handed a wafer, in the offering of the Eucharist, the priest still gives us the body of Christ. When she tells us to receive the body of Christ, whether in our hands or in our hearts, she is telling us to take that which we already are. In the action of every Eucharist, we feel the fusion of time and space. Word and sacrament together bring us, through the working of the Spirit, into the presence of Christ. Past, present and future come together simultaneously. The act of our celebration causes us every time to remember the Last Supper and Christ's passion at Calvary, but never more powerfully than on this night, the night on which our Lord was betrayed. As we create the body of Christ among us, so we look towards the coming of his kingdom. St Augustine explained in a powerful sermon on the Eucharist that we need to remember St Paul's assertion made a little later in the same letter to the Corinthians that they, that is we, are the body of Christ, member for member. Augustine wrote, If you therefore are Christ's body and members, it is your own mystery that is placed on the Lord's table. It is your own mystery that you are receiving. You are saying Amen to what you are. Your response is a personal signature affirming your faith. When you hear the body of Christ, you reply Amen. Be a member of Christ's body then, so that your Amen may ring true. As we prepare ourselves to participate in this Eucharistic mystery, as bread is broken and wine are poured, whether we may do so in person or by making our spiritual communion as we watch a service at home, let us prepare to renew our shared identity as the body of Christ. On this most holy of nights, let us strive to recreate for ourselves the intimacy of Christ's act of feeding Peter his disciple portrayed so vividly in the image before us. Whether we take Christ's body into our own mouth, or if we kneel before Christ in spirit, let us pray that the sharing of his body for us on the altar may reinforce our common belonging to the metaphorical body of Christ, 
that body of which we are all part through our joint participation in this sacrament, whether we come to the table daily or weekly, or to mark the holiest feasts of the church's year, or if we are painfully kept away from it. Receive what you are. Receive, in whatever way you can today, the body of Christ, broken for you. Amen.